This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I am an extremely lucky human being. I'm especially an extremely lucky human being as a citizen of the United States because somehow I have managed to spend my entire professional career as an artist and to always make a living as an artist. I've actually never in my life had a job that was not connected in some way to my work as a director, an actor, or an artistic director. Uh, I was really lucky. I never had to wait tables. I never had to be a busboy. I never had to be an elevator man. All of those things that people do in order to survive a life in the arts, I somehow managed to avoid. Uh, to be perfectly truthful with you. Some of that is great talent, some of that is ability, some of that is good looks. But in truth, some of that is just great, great good fortune. It's, it's like, honestly, it's like winning the lottery that that can be true for me, that that could be true for anybody. It, because we live in a country where, you know, the arts are not greatly valued and they're not greatly supported. So, as Marco will tell you, you, you can be, you can make a career as an actor in England because there are all those state-supported theaters around. And if you're willing to stay on the road and go here and go there and do this and do this, you can, you can probably make a career as an actor. That's very, very hard in the United States. Uh, but somehow I've, I've managed to do that. So I speak to you as someone who has that great good fortune and someone who is really proud to proclaim, and I sometimes have been accused of being slightly arrogant because I will use that word, but I'm proud to pro proclaim that I am an artist and that I've made my living as an artist and I've made my living practicing the art of the theater. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my life in the theater. And I think the, uh, the technical name of this lecture, if you will, or this conversation is my life in the theaters, because I've also had the good fortune of not just working in one theater, though I've had one theater home for the last 15 years, but working in theaters both all over the country and all over the world. An unbelievable, but absolutely true story is that now as the person who's been working at Pasadena Playhouse as the artistic director for the last 15 years, the truth is that my first professional theater going experience was at Pasadena Playhouse. And because of something that my father, who was a, a, a Presbyterian minister, who started a church in, in uh, Los Angeles in the 40s, he very much believed in the, the value of the arts in young people's lives, whether you wanted to become an artist or not, whether you ever had any intention of doing anything in the arts with the rest of your life. He just felt that it was vitally important for his children, and when I say his children, I'm talking about all of the children in that church, and me as well, and my brother, for all of us to be exposed to the arts. So uh, every other weekend or so, we would go downtown to see uh, a conductor named Henry Lewis conduct the, uh, the symphony in LA. We would go to the opera. We would go to dance concerts. And I remember waking up very early on a Saturday morning and getting on a bus at my father's church and making what, it, what was at that time, <laughs> and in some ways still is, 
the very, very long journey from Compton, which is a section in southeast LA, to Pasadena, a divide of a certain number of miles, but in some ways a real divide, especially at that time, and a real destination for this young black kid from, from Compton. And I got on this bus along with my friends, and uh, we went to see a wonderful play at Pasadena Playhouse called The Member of the Wedding by Carson McCullers, which many of you have read in one of its forms. And uh, first of all, that's a play that's about a young person. It's about Frankie, a young girl who is facing a crisis in her life. So I was immediately drawn to the fact that here I was sitting in a theater watching a play about somebody who was like me, who was my age. That, of course, moved me greatly. The other thing was that this was late, late, late in her career. But uh, this particular production at the Playhouse featured, or starred, I should say, uh, a tremendous actress named Ethel Waters, who the majority of you in here will never have heard of. But Ethel Waters was one of, genuinely, one of the great, great stars of the American theater, and had been working in the American theater at that point for probably 60 years. Um, so she, believe me, <laughs> had been playing this part like the Count of Monte Cristo for 20 years, and she had every effect was perfectly calibrated. And if you, if you ever wanted to see a diva on the stage, you should have seen Ethel Waters in this play. And if things get a little looser later, I'll, I'll show you Ethel Waters' bow, <laughs> which is a real coup de théâtre, unmatched still in my theater-going experiences. And I've been to see a lot of theater. But I got to know you a little bit better before I give you that. <laughs> Wait for it. Um, so I always say to people that it would be a much better story if I told you, and that was the day that I decided that I would spend the rest of my life working in the theater. That's not true. Better story if I could say that, but in fact, that's not true. I wanted to be a lawyer for most of my young years after that. Um, but it is the, light, the day that I discovered the true magic of the theater. I discovered the fact that you could go to a room like this, you could sit down, you could be told a story, and if that story was told well, whether it was the period that you're living in, or it was Shakespeare, or it was a Greek play, or it was about a young Southern girl in the 40s. If that play was, was performed well, and that story was well told, there might be something in it that could illuminate your life and your experience. And I had that incredible experience that day in the theater where I now work, and have worked for 15 years at Pasadena Playhouse. And of course, there was also seeing the stunning Miss Waters. So I did fall in love with the act of going to the theater. Years after that, uh, I moved to New Jersey, which at the age of 11 was a big move from a black community in Los Angeles to a nearly all Jewish community in New Jersey. I was a lonely kid. I was a little bit shy and not really sports prone. So the truth is that I was looking for a place to be. I was looking for a group of people to whom I could connect. And I found that in the drama club. I found that in doing plays. I did Our Town, I did Dark of the Moon, I did a bunch of musicals. So through that experience, I also learned that the act of creation could also be a great act of community, that there was a bonding that went on among artists that could serve me in a very deep psychological way. Not, not the applause at the end of the show, not, 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 the, not the letters of compliments from teachers or, or whoever, but the bonding that went on in that act of creation, in going to those rehearsals every day, and doing the work together, and trying to figure out how to make 
this stack of papers into something that resembled life, into something that resembled what I'd seen at Pasadena Playhouse. So I did that for several years, and then finally it struck me <laughs> like a bolt of lightning that maybe that was something that I wanted to do for my career. And I announced that quite boldly at the dinner table one night, and after my parents got up off the floor, they said, okay, you can do that. If you want to be an actor, if that's really what your dream is, that's your passion, be an actor. The only thing you have to do is you've got to go to college and you've got to get a degree. The best thing my parents ever said to me. The yes and the go to college, get your training for it. So there was going to be none of that, oh, I'm just going to go to New York and, you know, try to be a working actor and hang out in the village or whatever and take classes. They wanted me to go to school, and I did. Now, as I said, I went to a very, very good drama school called Carnegie Mellon University. And um, from there, I, I started my career initially as an actor, and I was an actor for about four or five years after I graduated from Carnegie. And I think I was an okay actor. I think it was all right. I was, I was a working actor. I, wor I worked a fair amount, as I said. I, between acting and unemployment, I never had to take another job. And that was a great time, because you could live on unemployment in New York at that time. So you now you're all thinking, what was that, the 1860s? <laughs> Very nearly. Um, but you know, unemployment was just enough that you could squeeze by. And so be because I was working, because I had that government subsidy, as I call it, I, I got together with a group of four or five friends of mine, and I started a theater company. And it was a very tiny theater company. I would say that the entire room was probably, now I'm not talking about the stage, I'm talking about the entire room in which we started this theater was, was probably back to the door there, so the first, the first section of the orchestra. Um, but it, it was a place where we could do what we wanted to do. A room and a passion, it's often said, is all you need to create great theater. Well, we had a room and we had a great passion, and there were four or five of us who'd gone to Carnegie together, and this, this is where we uh, came together to exercise that passion. Truly, it was a little bit out of frustration because, frankly, that was not a great time to be a classically trained actor of color because um, this thing called non-traditional casting which I think is an odious term because traditions are good things. <laughs> and it was never a good thing that, you know, open-minded casting, as I call it, existed. Um, so I was a little frustrated that I had trained myself to be a good classical actor and to have certain skills and all of that. And then, you know, mainly people, I, I remember this quite distinctly. I went in to uh, audition for the role of Tybalt in, um, Romeo and Juliet. And I went in and I used all my, my, my good classical training and I thought I was doing a good job with it. And the director said to me, well, that's nice, but could you do it a little bit more streetsy? Streetsy, Romeo and Juliet, Tybalt. Hmm, well, don't know about that, but let me see what I can do. Or, or actually, I think, you stupid jerk. <laughs> see ya, see you later. Uh, so, those were kind of frustrations that I had as, as an actor that, that led me to want to be part of this theater company where I could say, this is a play I want to do. This is a role I want to work on. This is a play that I think is good for the four of us, so let's do it. And I was talking to David before, and, and to tell you the truth, one of the luxuries of that time, and it was many years ago, is that it was cheap to do theater in New York then. You know, I think we paid, we paid $500 in rent for that space. That would not happen now. So good fortune. I had the good fortune to start a theater company in New York City at a time when one could afford to do that and not, not have a benefactor. I think we all put in something like $250 to get it started. And that was where I started directing, uh, really because we had trouble finding directors that we all sort of liked and agreed on. And so Norman René, who was the director among us, said one day, you know, I think you think like a director, so why don't you, why don't you try it? And I very modestly 
began my directing career with Midsummer Night's Dream, which was foolhardy and crazy. Um, but it went okay, and then I started directing at other theaters in New York, Manhattan Theater Club, and Playwrights Horizons, and a place called the Phoenix Theater, which existed at that time. And I never really made a firm decision not to be an actor anymore, but I found that about after about a year and a half, I hadn't acted, and I hadn't really missed it. So somehow, God, good fortune, fate, all of those things had given me the opportunity to be in a place and do what I wanted to do and define my personal path in the arts, which was to direct. And quite happily, I just said, okay, I'm a director now, and I'm really happy being a director. I don't miss acting. I certainly do not miss the audition process, which is part of being an actor. So I'll just be a director. And I think, not that you can't do both, not that you shouldn't do both, but I was never, I was never a director who was wanting to be an actor, who was wanting to get people to play a part the way that I would play it. So all, all I was there for was to serve the actors and to help them shine in the way that the best of directors had helped me to shine when I was acting. Fortunately, I did a show that David mentioned called Blues in the Night that started in my little theater that then went to Broadway and then went to London and was a big success in London and then was produced at theaters all over the country and that became my kind of calling card. Then I went to um, the Old Globe Theater, not the Globe Theater, the Old Globe Theater in San Diego, uh, to do a play and uh, was asked by a very wonderful, brilliant director and besides that, a brilliant artistic director, a man named Jack O'Brien, um, asked me to come back to the theater under a grant to be his associate artistic director. And it was a great opportunity because the itinerant life was starting to get to me. And I was starting to tire of that. So to go to a theater, to have a theater that was a home base, that I could call a home, was a great opportunity. And it was a great opportunity for me to study what I call the art of artistic direction, which is different than the art of directing. The art of directing is about getting that play onto the stage, getting that musical onto the stage. The art of artistic direction is about building an institution, building a community, and defining a vision for what you want a place to be. And Jack, fortunately, Jack O'Brien, was, is, one of the most secure people in the American theater. Not threatened by this young kid coming up. And so, this is what happened. At that moment in time, Jack O'Brien began what is his now very, very successful commercial producing and directing career on Broadway. So shortly after I got there, Jack said, you got it, honey. It's on you now. And I said, well, Jack, I, 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 I've never done this. What, what, what does that mean, I got it? He said, well, I'm not going to be here, so just do what I would do if I was here. He said, you know, I'll be a phone call away, but do what I would do if I was here. Believe me, there are very few people who are secure enough to say, I believe in you, take it, run with it, learn how to do it by doing it. Again, strike of great good fortune that it was that theater at that time with that person. And he was always there for me. And when I got into trouble or didn't know how to do something, even in the middle of you know, rehearsals for a Broadway show, he would stop and take the time to talk me through it. I call that my graduate school training in the art of artistic direction. And it really was what prepared me for four years to then go to Pasadena Playhouse. Pasadena Playhouse, uh, for those of you who don't know, is one of the oldest theaters in America. Uh, it was actually, the, the producing company was actually started in 1917. So it's coming up on its 100th anniversary as an, as an existing theater. The theater itself was built in 1925. A beautiful, beautiful theater. 
Um, and in truth, one of the first times I went back there as, as uh, a guest director, before I was artistic director, I quite simply had a feeling of deja vu because I'd forgotten that I'd seen Member of the Wedding there. And I remember we have a beautiful courtyard in front of the theater, and I remember walking through the courtyard and just kind of saying, gee, I feel like I've, I've been here before. And I went to somebody at, at some point and said, is it possible that Member of the Wedding was done here many, many years ago? She said, yes, it is. And she went and she found the program for me. So I was returning to that place that truly was sort of my theatrical birthplace. Returning now, obviously, in a very, very different position. And to a theater that, though it had quite a long history, also had quite a roller coaster history. Meaning this, though that theater is one of the oldest theaters in America, it's, it's a theater that's had real highs and real lows including the fact that it was closed for about 12 years, I think in the, the late 60s to the early 80s. And like the, uh, like the Joni Mitchell song, was almost torn down, literally. The theater was almost torn down so that it could be paved and turned into a parking lot. Uh, I'm telling you that there was a woman who, like Norma Ray, strapped herself to the front of the theater and said, this is not going to happen and got it declared a historical landmark so that it could not be turned down, and eventually it was reopened. So though, though when it reopened, it had uh, some great success, partially due to the fact that it just reopened, but also to some good productions. But then it got into some, some trouble again. And um, they let some staff go. <clears throat> And for a while, there had not been an artistic director at that theater prior to my coming there. Um, there was an executive director who was doing all of the business side of things, but, but sort of wasn't really, didn't really keep his eye on, on the artistic side of things. So one of my great reasons for success as artistic director was I had to be better than the person who was there right before me, because nobody was there right before me. So, I took the opportunity of just focusing on the artistic life of the place. So in terms of what this class is about, what we're talking about, what does that mean? And what does it mean to be an artistic director? Uh, Leslie is fond of saying, Leslie Brander, who works in your development department, is, say, is fond of saying, well, that just means that you pick the plays, right? Isn't that all you do? You just pick the shows? Yeah, I've heard you say it many times. <laughs> Um, well, yes, that is one of the things that you do. You do pick the plays, you do pick the shows. But if you're doing it well, and I was taught this by Jack O'Brien, I was taught this by another great artistic director named Garland Wright, who was at the Guthrie Theater for many years. If you're doing it well, as your artistic director does it well, you're picking those plays not just because you like them, not just because you want to direct them, not just because I think you ought to see it, or you all ought to see it, or not just because they're to my taste, but because they represent something about what you want the life of this theater to be in total. And the life of a theater in total, if you're doing it well, has a lot to do with what you do on your stage, but it doesn't only have to do with what you do on the stage. It has to do with the experience, literally, the experience of coming to your theater. There's a great architect named Philip Johnson who designed a lot of the most beautiful buildings in America, and he said, or somebody asked him, what's, what's your theory of architecture? He said, walking up to the building. He said, what does that mean? You know, you build these great big skyscrapers. He said, there's nothing that is more important in architecture than the approach to the building. You gotta make people wanna come into the building. <laughs> 
There's a parallel in that to the life of a theater. It's not just the way the building looks. It's not just the way the plays on the stage look. There's something about the invitation to the event that will go on inside that I believe has to begin on that procession to the theater. There's something about the invitation to the event, the approach to the event, that is as important as the event itself. It is about, you've heard me use the word many times tonight, community. It is about the community building that goes on, both in the long term, in the support of your theater, and it's a not-for-profit theater, so it needs support of all kind. There's a community building that goes on to support your theater over a long-term process, but there's also a community building that goes on right before the show begins. There is something about what happens out in that plaza in front of your theater, or what happens out in front of the Glen, among the people who are coming in to see the show, that palpably affects that performance. If you build, build your theater, if you build your art, I believe, in the most passionate, blood-filled way, and don't think, I'm serving you, so come to me. Let my theater be this palace on the hill that you are lucky enough to come to. If you don't think that way, if you think, we're all in this together, I would not in any way be here without you. If you build your theater in that way, you begin to have the possibility of building a great institution. That's an effort that you've got to make, and there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. It takes all kinds of support. It also takes great artistry. <laughs> you know, the approach is important, but the truth is, it's also about delivering once people get into the building. It is certainly something you can think about. It's certainly something you can plan. It's something you can pray about. But finally, it's, it's, it's something of a divine chemical intervention, I would call it, that makes the spirit of a place come together in a way that makes your building a worthwhile theater. And I think that's true of all, of all art forms, it's certainly true of all performing arts. There's something about the spirit, specifically now, of what Dudamel is doing with the symphony in Los Angeles that has completely changed the perception and made that place, made this place where they play classical music the sexiest thing to do in Los Angeles. That's amazing that it is the sexiest experience that you can have in LA right now in the performing arts is to go to hear these 300-year-old symphonies. It's amazing that somehow he's, he's managed to do that. And no, you know, no, uh, no disrespect to the previous wonderful conductor, Esapekat Salina, great, great musician, also very successful. But the experience of what he delivered was a very different finish <laughs> experience than the hot Latin experience that Dudamel delivers playing exactly the same music. And he elicits something out of that community of musicians and that community that is in the theater that just creates a different kind of heat about the very same text. <laughs> It's, 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 it is the heat that I felt the first time I saw the Royal Shakespeare Company and I saw a production of Coriolanus. Very, very difficult play. Very tough, um, kind of cold play. One of Shakespeare's tougher, meaner plays. A real anti-hero of the guy. But the Royal Shakespeare Company built this experience over many years, and that particular ex experience, that made it have great meaning for this young black guy who was coming from New York to see Royal Shakespeare Company for the first time, who immediately got everything that was up on that stage in something of 
a foreign language, one might say. You know, the, the, the magic that the theater can have to transform all of us by what's going on up here through the life of a theater is a very, very special thing. Now, I will tell you, and then I'm going to shut up and let you ask some questions if you want to. I will tell you that Pasadena Playhouse recently had one of those rough times in its life. For all of the fact that we were having great uh, artistic success over the last 10, 12 years, um, the economic downturn in 2008 hit this theater hard because this was a theater that from its initiation um, as a not-for-profit was carrying a big debt load. So this debt load had been carried for almost 20 years from long before I got there. So it was a theater that was always running <laughs> in front of this massive snowball of debt that was right behind it. And when the economic downturn happened in 2008, and suddenly donations dried up for a while, we couldn't run anymore. Just couldn't. Snowball was too big and we were too tired. And, you know, we either had to get out of the way or, or be killed by this snowball. So um, after struggling through it for about a year, through the year 2009, with a new executive director, we made the very tough decision that the, the best thing that we could do was just to stop and try to solve this problem, to stop producing. Now, I will tell you that's the scariest thing that you can imagine for an artistic director, for someone to tell you that what you should do is to stop producing plays. You should shut the doors for a while because with the best of planning, with the best of intentions, you don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> you don't know, really, if anybody's going to care. And there are great, great arts organizations that have made that decision, that tough decision, and they've disappeared. I don't think any of them, or few of them, made that decision with the intention that they were going to go away, but that's what happened. There weren't enough people who cared to keep that theater alive. But we sort of didn't have a choice because the creative life of the theater, that spark that I was talking about before, was beginning to get dampened by all of these economic circumstances. So even I finally had to come around and say, you know, that's true. We do need to stop. We do need to find out if people care. And the fact is, and I could go in, into it at length, but the fact is that what happened is we discovered that people really did care. We intended to stop producing for a while and begin again. Fortunately, it didn't get reported in the newspaper that way. It got reported as Pasadena Playhouse is closed forever. At the, at the time that happened, that was terrifying to me to read that in the LA Times. But the fact is that that turned out to be a good thing because it made people sit up and pay attention. It made people say, oh my God, this thing that I really value, that I really care for, may actually go away. So suddenly people started to do some things that we've been asking them to do for years and years. I'm talking about donated revenue now. They certainly started to do some things because it was, it was so dramatic, oddly enough, that they might not have done otherwise. And the community came together in uh, an incredible way to say, we cannot let this happen. We cannot allow this, this palace of art, if you will, to become a parking lot. It won't get torn down, but somebody can come along and put an apartment building in there, which has happened in one other theater in Pasadena. So um, it was hard work. It was frightening. It was scary. It was debilitating. But at the same time, there were lots of forces that started to come together monetarily, legally, in terms of board support, in terms of other artists, 
I cannot tell you the huge amount of support that I got from artists all over the country and in fact all over the world who just said, I'm there for you. I don't have a lot of money, but I'm there for you emotionally. I'm there for the theater emotionally. All of that emotional support and literal support actually allowed us to go through what could have been a very long process in a very brief amount of time and get the theater reopened. There is a question that occurs now and then in America about whether theater is relevant anymore. Do we need it? Could we do without it? You know, you can, most television sets have a choice of 650 things that you can watch at any given moment. You can have a movie instantly. Um, so, so people say now and then, well, is the theater dead? Well, first of all, they've been saying, is the theater dead since I worked at the Globe with Shakespeare? Um, <laughs> and clearly it's not dead. But still this question exists, are, are American theaters relevant? And are this kind of American theaters relevant? Well, I'm here to testify to you that American theaters do seem to be relevant, that there are people who care, there are people who want that profound sense of community that comes from all of us coming into this room together and seeing this event up here in a way that it will only be created tonight in this special way because we are here together. No matter what, it will be different tomorrow. So the vitality, the joy, the mirror to our society, the reflection of our lives, and the celebration, the very celebration of who and what we are that is special and particular in the theater and through the craft and the art of the theater is, I believe, absolutely important, is relevant, and still has the great ability to change, modify our world. Art, Romare Bearden says, the great, great artist Romare Bearden says, art is the only thing that distinguishes us from other mammals. It's the only thing that should make us stand up, stand tall, and celebrate the triumph of the human spirit. Other mammals are stronger. Other mammals are faster. <laughs> other mammals surely can be more beautiful. But we, this species, can create art. And that is the thing that makes us powerful. I'll ask, answer some questions. <laughs> So um, while you're thinking about your questions, I, I had a question for you. I was thinking about what the, uh, when I look at sort of a variety of art making, because I'm an artist, um, I kind of, as an audience, I, I wear different kinds of hats. But one of the things that always um, sort of, um, that I really like about film, and I think not about theater, it's, it's probably because um, we're in a, a situation where we're saturated with film that has special effects and sort of everything's kind of, uh, the world is created in front of you. And, and what I like about film, it, uh, see this, you can see that. You can like film yeah. too, that's okay. <laughs> I like film. What I like, I like about theater, and I don't, probably don't go to it enough, but that in a kind of more limited set of circumstances, that, that whole idea of creating a world, of creating an atmosphere, creating a period of time, um, I love the, the economy that which it's done, and, and that it always um, sort of knocks me out and sort of uh, gives me some information and some processes that I can use in kind of my own art making. So I, I guess I wanted to know if you, you had any more to, to say about that, that it, it partly it gets to the idea that, you know, what you do and why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if what the question is there, but... Uh, well, I think, uh, listen, I, I love movies. Mm -hmm. I love to go to movies. I've fortunately 
as a guy who lives in LA, I've never been terribly, terribly attractive to being a movie director, so I don't have that frustration. Mm -hmm. You know, people often come to you and say, well, wouldn't you really like to direct a film? Well, no, not really. I'm very, very happy being an artist in the theater. Movies give you everything. Right. There, there are a lot of people whose job it is to totally create the world. And if the world is Niagara Falls, there's people who have to get Niagara Falls up there on the film with you standing in front of it somehow. If the world is Avatar, which is an incredible world, look at all the credits at the end of that movie for all of the people who give you all of that stuff that make you think you were realistically in that place. That's not the art and the craft of the theater. The art and the craft of the theater is to take movement, take words, perhaps, take craft, imagination, both mine and yours, and transport you to that world, perhaps with nothing. Some of my best theater experiences have been watching plays on bare stages, you know, with a great actor and a great text. <laughs> so we have um, some questions. Hi, my name is Dominic. Um, Hi, Dominic. How you doing? Uh, okay. Uh, you, so you were talking about, um, you know, what it takes to be an artistic director and how it has to do with the experience of coming to the theater and uh, you have to choose um, plays that represent the life of the theater and everything. I was wondering actually just a little bit more about that, um, like, and it, like some examples of things you've done to, to keep that spark alive, sort of. Well, okay, I, I can tell you that. Um, when, when I came to Pasadena Playhouse, the truth is the Pasadena Playhouse, and, and it's part of the fact, I believe, that it was in the artistic doldrums, the, the same, the Pasadena Playhouse was doing the same play over and over and over again. I don't mean that literally. The plays had many, many different titles, but what they were doing was a, a, a one set, realistic set play with four or five people who all looked alike who thought they were funny. <laughs> and sometimes they were, and frequently they were not. Mm -hmm. But they all thought they were very clever and came out and said things that they really thought they were clever, usually about not very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, honestly, I used to sit, when I, was a, when I was a freelance director and during my first few years there, as uh, artistic director, I used to sit in the courtyard of that theater and see only people who wanted to see that kind of play. So mm. all I saw were people who were white and over 60. Yeah. And I thought that was terrifying. Not that they were white, <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> but the fact that, that the majority of that, uh, that 60 was young <laughs> at, at many of those performances, that's terrifying because that, that meant that that audience was going to go away very soon for natural causes. Not because they were bored with the place, they, they were just going to not be able to come very soon. So my answer to that was really a reflection of my personal taste, which is to do a vast theatrical diversity of plays. People think that diversity to me, to me, they immediately think that means that I'm really interested in getting black people into the theater. I am very interested in getting black people into Pasadena Playhouse, and we've done that very successfully. The real diversity that I was more interested in was getting you into the theater and most of you in here. You know, people your age <laughs> for the theater Young people, meaning people who were 35 and 40. Yeah. I was really interested in how do you begin to build the theater so that you attract that audience as opposed to the, those 60 and 70 year olds. That is a great challenge for my theater. It's a great challenge for the American theater as a whole. And it has to do with the programming, but it also has to do with the life again that you create around that theater. Singles nights sound like a frivolous thing to do at a theater, but it's really a great thing to do because 
it makes, it makes the act of coming to the theater attractive to a 25-year-old, both for the experience of the play and because they're going to see other people like themselves there. It also has to do with building younger audiences, and when I say younger in this case, I mean getting students to your theater. The Playhouse, when I got there, had not done a student matinee in something like 15 years, and I thought that was a horrible crime mm -hmm. because people 8, 9, and 10 were not getting the experience that I had when I was 8, 9, and 10. And people fought me about that and said, well, you don't make any money on that. And it's, it's expensive. It costs money. And I said, well, I'll pay for the first one because I believe so strongly that that was a part of the life of the theater. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Noah. Um, my experience with the theater is, is limited. I've, I've seen a number of plays and took um, an introductory theater class at a community college uh, over, over the last summer. Um, but I did see San Francisco Mime Troupe a while ago, and um, that really struck me. Uh, so I was wondering if you have any sort of relationship with uh, with street theater, particularly as a form of um, uh, social activism. Um, and if so, if you could elaborate on that. Um, my immediate answer is, is no, I don't. Uh, I've seen San Francisco Mime Troupe. Uh, one of the great things about the American theater, though, is that it does have that kind of diversity. <clears throat> I said that I never had to do a job outside of the, uh, my field. But one of the jobs that I did for many, many years was when they had this program, I was a site visitor for the National Endowment for the Arts. And what that meant was that I used to go around to theaters see their work and write a report, which then became part of the grant process. It's a great shame that that actually has been cut out of the NEA because the NEA doesn't have enough money to do that anymore. But what it meant was that I, I got to go to something like 200 different theaters all over the country. And I went to theaters as large as ACT and the Guthrie. But then I used to see stuff in one of the best things I ever saw in my life was similar to the kind of work you're talking about. It was literally in the back room of a bar in Johnson City, Tennessee, where the guys sitting at the bar at 8 o'clock would all grab their beers and go into the back room and watch this play that was written about their town. And I, I said, that is great theater. <laughs> when, you can, when you can get these guys to get off those bar stools, bring the beers if they want to, but really connect with this play that is about the life of this community, that's, that's great, great art making. So if that's the kind of work you're interested in, either in participating in or going to see, I applaud you, because I think that's great theater. Right, thank you very much. Oh, we did do a, we did, there is a, a wonderful theater company in, uh, in LA called Cornerstone Theater, which does very much that kind of work, and it's all community-based and, and, and drawn from the community. And we did do a co-production with Cornerstone. One of the things that I'm proud of that we've done at the theater is we, um, we've done a lot of collaborations with smaller theater companies in Los Angeles. I was lucky that somebody said to me, come and direct on this big stage. You know, come and direct at this big theater. So there are a lot of great theater companies in LA that operate in very, very small theaters. So I haven't done it as much as I would like to, but I've invited those small theater companies to come into our great big theater and expand their work and use, you know, use the fact that we have wing space, we have fly space, and we actually have real lights to create your work. One of the best of those was the Cornerstone experience, but also we did a collaboration with a theater company called Deaf West Theater, which is a company of, of, of deaf actors. And that was, that was a great, great experience. It was one of the first times that a major theater company had done uh, a co-production with them of a new play, a play that was commissioned for them. The best thing about that experience was the audience 
that would come into the theater and sit next to the subscribers. And the fact that people had to learn to talk to each other out there in a different way. Hi, my name is Melanie. Um, Melanie. Actually, my first question was kind of similar to his. Um, we've been talking a lot about issues and artists and trying to connect broader global issues to art. Um, one of the things about theater, though, is as much as I think it's important to engage in what the playwright is saying and, and try to really understand the issues that they're tackling, is it's, it's about what you're saying, is that community, right? Like that, that experience of being on stage and being able to interact with other actors while having you know, an audience there to engage with you. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I really think theater has a profound impact on the way people think and the way people feel. And I was wondering you know, if you had any stories about anyone who had been um, deeply moved or changed um, by productions you've done or by your audience members. Hmm. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of stories like that. It's, it's interesting when, you, when you're at a theater for a long time and when you, when you choose to program your theater by doing lots of different kinds of plays as opposed to that one kind of play. And you'll, you'll do a play that might be considered risky because it's about a hard topic. And we did a play called Bipolar Woman, um, an original play uh, about a woman suffering from bipolar disease. It wasn't a completely successful script by any means. But it, it addressed that issue very head on. A lot of people really did not like that play. <coughs> it was actually a funny play, but a lot of people found it quite depressing and didn't like it because it was depressing and it made you think about it. But individually, I would have many people come up to me and say, thank you for doing this play because my brother is bipolar. My mother, <laughs> a lot of people said their mother is bipolar, whether she is or not. <laughs> Someone in my family is bipolar, and this play will help me to deal with that. We also did a very beautifully written play called Waverly Gallery uh, that's about a woman suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Again, not terribly popular, not a big seller, not box office wise a great success, a good production of the play. So many people would come up to me and say, thank you for putting my life up there mm -hmm. because my father, my mother, my grandmother is suffering in the same way that that woman is. And it's given me some clues about how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly, if nothing else, it makes me feel less lonely. So that's, that's a great power that the theater can have is to, is to engage we can engage in a conversation right. about some things that maybe we, we would not talk about otherwise. Mm -hmm. it, can make, it can address an issue for you that's going on up here and make you feel less lonely about it. I certainly have had that experience many, many times watching right. the theater, many yeah. times. Well, thank you so much for your work and thank you for coming thank here you. to lecture. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Um, hi, my name is David. Hi, David. Um, the, the very brief, it, something you said at the very beginning and then you repeated it uh, just a few minutes ago, it bothered me. And that was, I, I think I've got it right. Theater you should said, be all about agitation. <laughs> no, 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 no. You said you've never had a job that wasn't involved in the theater. You said yes. it twice. Yes. As a kid, didn't you deliver newspapers? Didn't you do anything? Didn't you have a lemonade stand? <laughs> You're, you, I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, well, would you say a word about that, what you did I, I will, on? I will. I, all right, Dave. <laughs> uh, I, I stand correct. I should have said, in my adult life, I've never... Because as a teenager, you are correct. I would, every afternoon at 5 o'clock, I would go to the barber shop on the corner 
and I would sweep up the hair from the day's work and get 50 cents or a dollar, which was good money at that point in my life. I stand corrected. I may go back to that any moment now. <laughs> well, I'm glad we have the record corrected. Let's um, give uh, Sheldon another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, yes. We want to see the Ethel Waters bow. I think you know us well enough now. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, the member of the wedding, Ethel Waters. And um, as I said, Miss Waters was quite elderly by that time. So part of the power of her performance was that you were just amazed that she could get up there and still do it. But she was really doing it. And, you know, you'd seen her up there, and she was a, she was a powerhouse of a woman. Not a very big woman, but a powerhouse of a woman. So the bow comes. And though Miss Waters' part is not the biggest part in the play, the biggest part in the play is, is Frankie, is the young girl. The bow comes. And, you know, curtain comes down, and the curtain goes up, and people come out. <laughs> people come out, and, you know, you're waiting for Miss Waters to come out. And finally, you know, Frankie comes out. She takes her bow, and the curtain comes down without a bow from Ethel Waters. And you say, what's going on? And you're still applauding. You're saying, oh, I see. They're just going to clear this stage for her. But the curtain curtain stays down for a long time, a long time, and certainly applause starts to drift off, you know, and people really start to get scared. And you say, oh my God, I've seen Ethel Waters' last performance. <laughs> the woman died. She gave it her all, and she died. And literally, you start to think that. The curtain stays down for a long time. There's this sort of mumble going on. What's, what's the matter? Where's, where's the just as it starts to get really agitating, the curtain starts to creep up so slowly. You see a little bit of light, and it's just creeping up. You say, OK, she's going to come out now. The curtain finally goes up. And there's Ethel Waters way upstage on the porch, right, in her rocking chair. And the curtain goes up, and she's sitting there just rocking. Everybody goes mad. And she just keeps <laughs> endlessly just rocking. So of course, everybody <laughs> applauds more and more and more. She just keeps rocking, you know? And just as people are starting to throw babies from the balcony with <laughs> applause, you know, she just keeps rocking. And finally, she goes, Okay, now this woman has been running around the stage all night long, right? So she's, you know, she's here, oh my God. There were people out there all night long, you know, and she, she, she reaches out her hand this way, and the little boy comes out, and she reaches out her hand this way, and Frankie comes out, and these poor, you know, kids have to lift her out of that rocking chair. And she comes from 40 feet upstage as slowly as she can come, <laughs> all the way down to the very lip of the stage. And if you're really, if you can really see her, if you really watch closer, you see her sort of flick the little boy off, and <laughs> flick the little girl off. And then she finally manages to pull herself up. <laughs> 